All right, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Frank's research group. We are working on probabilistic programming and applications in science, including high energy physics and uh, high performance computing. Uh, I am mostly interested in automatic differentiation, which will be the subject of this talk, and evolutionary algorithms and a bit of computational physics. So uh, deep learning is one of the themes in this summer school, so uh, I thought it would be good to provide an overview of that uh, uh, before going into the automatic differentiation part. So I don't know your level of familiarity with it, but let me just uh, cover uh, basic concepts in deep learning. So deep lear it is a reincarnation of uh, artificial neural networks, which is a very old idea dating back to 1940s and 50s. Uh, here you see Frank Rosenblatt, the inventor of the perceptron, uh, which was, by the way, a machine instead of an algorithm, uh, holding a set of neural network weights, which were like uh, potentiometers that you can adjust by uh, turning them and trying to teach the network to some task. And uh, we use backpropagation, which was invented in 1970s. So th all these things are very uh, established, old techniques that, uh, that are currently working very well due to uh, the things I'm going to summarize. Uh, so it is currently the state of the art in computer vision. Uh, this has been the case since this uh, ImageNet uh, uh, competition in 2012. Uh, when someone uh, attempted to apply convolutional neuralness for image recognition, and which was uh, almost revolutionary. It helped the uh, error that was achieved by uh, non-deep learning techniques previously. You can see the uh, see it happening here. This is uh, basically the, uh, the point where deep learning got, uh, got to uh, have the fame it has today. And it replaced hand-engineered hand features and uh, modern deep learning systems surpass uh, human, human performance for image recognition tasks. Uh, this is also the case with speech recognition. Previously, people were using uh, uh, statistical methods uh, based on hidden marker models and Gaussian mixture models. Uh, again, uh, deep learning systems starting around 2012, they, they applied uh, neural networks, uh, trained with lots of data, and they surpassed uh, the previous state of the art. Uh, another interesting uh, application is machine translation. Uh, this is based on uh, recurrent neural networks or convolutional neural networks. Uh, so the, again, this replaced the previous uh, hand engineering features uh, based statistical translation pipeline. And all major companies are uh, uh, deploying this as their uh, uh, daily machine translation system. The last was Facebook, which Replaces, uh, which replaced their uh, machine translation system just this month, uh, a few weeks ago, with the full deep learning system. Uh, an interesting thing to see here is this uh, plot uh, for Google's neural machine translator. Here you see with blue uh, the previous machine learning approach, uh, non-deep learning. Uh, uh, yellow is the human. So you can see, for example, uh, for the language pair, like translation from French to English, uh, you get near human level uh, translation performance, the quality of translation. And this is all happening uh, just by supplying data to a uh, recurrent neural network. So I will try to cover uh, why these things are uh, starting to work so well, um, what, what makes deep learning tick, what is, what is really the thing behind it. Uh, so uh, probably all of you are familiar with uh, artificial neural networks or the idea. So you have a very uh, you have a uh, mathematical structure very loosely based on a real neural net uh, neural uh, neural cell. Uh, so you have a, a collection of inputs uh, weighted by some uh, connection weights. You have a summation and you have a, a nonlinear transformation, and this goes on into the uh, other nodes in your network. And you have like a selection of uh, activation functions. This is the nonlinearity. The fashion right now is to use uh, rectified linear units and uh, hyperbolic tangent. Uh, there is uh, there is research going on uh, about the properties and why they work so well or why they don't work for uh, different applications. Uh, so you have basically three types. These are the classical types. Uh, you have feed-forward neural nets, you have uh, convolutional neural nets, or, and you have uh, recurrent units. Uh, basically, you build models as combinations of uh, compositions of the, these three basic uh, building blocks. 
uh, lately, uh, because the field is so active right now, there is a, a research going on in introducing new building blocks, and the focus has been on uh, uh, in, uh, introducing uh, neural network blocks that uh, emulate uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithmic control. For example, you have uh, something called a neural Turing machine, which is a differentiable uh, Turing machine uh, implemented as a neural network. You can train it with gradient descent to do algorithmic tasks such as uh, copy and sort, and you can you can uh, inspect uh, the behavior of the neural net where you see uh, Turing machine-like behavior. Uh, there are other uh, techniques in inspired by that, like discrete interfaces or stack augmented uh, neural networks. Uh, uh, so the important uh, uh, thing to uh, emphasize here is that these uh, neural networks don't, don't uh, require any uh, feature engineering. You don't have to think about what is the feature I need for, uh, for my data to make this problem uh, solvable. You just work with raw data. That's a very uh, interesting thing. Uh, over previous state of the art. So, for example, if you are doing uh, image recognition, you, you, your input is the raw pixels and your output is the object level. So, you can have uh, literally the RGB pixels going on, going in in one end. You can have like a person's name going, uh, coming out uh, of the other end. Or in speech recognition, you would just put the uh, raw waveform. And uh, the, what is happening here is in these uh, um, many layers, you learn a distributed representation. And this is also called uh, representation learning. Uh, so another important uh, thing to emphasize is uh, uh, the, the, the reason behind the name deep learning. Uh, it, it has been uh, shown consistently that deep, deeper architectures are uh, better uh, than shallow architectures. Uh, deeper meaning uh, you have uh, more and more layers uh, for, for a task. Uh, you can see the... Uh, Trends like this is the uh, first uh, neural network in 2012 for binning image uh, recognition task I mentioned. It only had eight layers, then you go up to the to 19 layers in Oxford VGGNet uh, just two years after that. And just uh, uh, two years ago, the, the, the winner of the same competition was this neural net with uh, 152 layers. And uh, it, the people are inventing tricks to uh, have more and more layers work with uh, gradient descent. Uh, and uh, uh, this basically is the trend. Uh, another important thing to, uh, uh, another important thing in deep learning is data. Uh, this is also one of the reasons they, uh, these neural network architectures were not performing very well in, back in 1980s and 90s. They didn't have enough data. Have enough data. Uh, now, uh, now uh, big companies have these, and this is the reason actually these uh, companies are uh, big players in uh, deep learning, because they have access to data, they have access to uh, computational resources. Uh, uh, the thing with deep neural architectures is that you need uh, millions and millions of labeled data if you are doing supervised learning. Uh, this is something uh, Frank was uh, also talking about. Uh, this is a quote, quote from uh, the deep learning book, the textbook of the field. Uh, it says you need at least 10 million labeled examples to be anywhere near human performance in, for any task. Uh, so this is uh, one of the biggest limitations, and this is the reason uh, probabilistic programming and deep learning uh, combine very well, because uh, basically what we are doing is we are supplying the data coming from a probabilistic model uh, and using that for training neural nets. Uh, another thing that enabled uh, the deep learning uh, revolution is the hardware, hardware uh, advances and uh, graphics processing units. Uh, the main reason uh, behind this is like at the end of the day, a neural network is just a series of matrix multiplications, and these are uh, implemented very fast on uh, uh, GPUs. And uh, the, uh, this basically starts around 2007 and quickly became the uh, standard thing to do. Uh, if you are doing deep learning, you are doing uh, you are running uh, matrix multiplications on a specialized uh, hardware architecture, uh, and there are things like uh, uh, people are uh, designing hardware specific for deep learning applications. This is also a current trend. Uh, uh, 
this one is uh, sometimes omitted I personally think this is a very important uh, uh, thing in the deep learning uh, because you have access to these uh, machine learning frameworks that allow you to express models in a very uh, straightforward way. This wasn't the case, for example, in 1990s, it, the training and neural network was treated as a black art. Like you were supposed to implement everything from scratch, including the uh, lower, uh, lower level implementations. So now, for example, today, if you start doing deep learning, you just pick your favorite deep learning framework. Uh, you would be good to go in a, in a couple of hours after reading some tutorials. But you can, you can run p other people's models, you can start training. Uh, so, and today, in the later part of this talk, I'm going to talk to you about PyTorch uh, due to some uh, advantages it has. And uh, all these uh, come with uh, high performance backends, like if you have a, uh, a CPU based system, you have MKL. If you have GPUs, you use CUDA. So, these things are just uh, out of the box, uh, good to go. And a uh, very important uh, bit is learning how do we perform uh, uh, learning. Uh, is basically we do back propagation to compute the uh, gradient of a loss value for a, a task specific loss with respect to the uh, <coughs> learnable parameters of your neural network. And we do uh, stochastic gradient descent, or we use in practice uh, adaptive learning rate uh, algorithms such as EDM and R RMS prop. Uh, uh, for this, we need derivatives on. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how these derivatives are uh, computed. Uh, so to sum up, uh, these are the three most important elements. You have neural networks, you have data, and you have gradient-based optimization. And for gradient-based optimization, we need derivatives. Uh, so the rest of the talk is about how we get these derivatives. Uh, so I'm going to cover uh, three cases. You can do manual or symbolic differentiation, you can do numerical differentiation, or you can do this thing called automatic differentiation. Uh, the manual one is the one you know from your calculus course. You have rules of differentiation, such as the uh, addition rule, the multiplication rule. It's just a uh, rule-based uh, 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 mechanistic procedure that you can apply until you get all the derivative. This, uh, Interestingly, when Leibniz introduced calculus, he, he has a quote in his book saying that one day this can be done by a machine. Uh, that's an interesting uh, thing. Uh, that was a reference to uh, this being a mechanistic procedure. Uh, so you can do this. And you, you need to do this if you are doing uh, analytic solutions, if you are doing proofs, if you are doing uh, analysis of stability. Uh, it's good to have uh, derivatives written in front of you, uh, but they are unnecessary if you are just interested in uh, numerical derivatives for the purpose of uh, gradient-based optimization. And, and this was, uh, until very recently, an interesting thing in the machine learning field was that, uh, for example, you, this is a real paper. If you zoom in enough, you will see which paper it is. I just picked this one for making this point. People uh, used to do, like, you introduce a new machine learning model in the first two pages. Then you spend all these pages uh, for driving the gradient equation so that you can use it in an optimization procedure. Uh, this was before these machine learning frameworks and the, uh, the ability of getting derivatives uh, for free. Uh, so uh, this is uh, thanks to automatic differentiation, this has changed. Uh, so you can do uh, automatic, uh, you can automate manual uh, differentiation, like the application of manual differentiation rules. You can use uh, symbolic uh, algebra packages like Mathematica uh, to do this uh, task for you in a, in a error-free way. The main issue here is that uh, when, you uh, when you differentiate an expression, uh, you have a problem called expression swell. And this is, uh, this is a very important limitation. You get uh, exponentially more complicated expressions as a, a result of differentiation operations. Uh, here I attempted to plot uh, uh, how, how uh, uh, expressions uh, swell can be seen in a, a logistic map. So for example, if you have this logistic map okay, equation, and if you have uh, the number of times this map is applied, 
uh, as n increases, you see like this is the original logistic map equation, and this is the uh, number of terms it's in its derivative. So this is uh, this is a very important thing uh, you should think about. And uh, if you are doing, uh, uh, if you, if you are, for example, familiar with Tiano, uh, the machine learning library, which is a symbolic differentiation, it is a step specifically implemented for taking care of this expression swell uh, problem. Uh, first, you differentiate, then you uh, simplify these terms into something more manageable. <coughs> uh, another problem with these symbolic derivatives is that they are only applicable to closed form expressions. Uh, what I mean by that is like uh, you can differentiate something that looks like this because this corresponds to a, a mathematical formula. Uh, you need to be able to write it down in terms of maths to apply uh, differentiation rules, but you cannot. Uh, have the derivative of something with uh, algorithmic control flow. Uh, this is an important limitation that the uh, uh, TNN tensor flow is facing. For example, you are not free to implement your uh, uh, algorithm in a free way. You are supposed to use the limited uh, 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 symbolic graph uh, mini language to express uh, control flow operations. So I will uh, talk a bit more about that. Uh, you can do numerical differentiation. This means uh, you are approximating the values of derivatives by using uh, the limit definition of derivative uh, with a small uh, constant. Uh, this is very straightforward and easy to think about, but the problem with it is that uh, you get approximation <coughs> errors, you get round of errors, and you get truncation errors. Uh, you might think that by decreasing h as much as you can, you can, you can get rid of the errors, but this is um, not the case, unfortunately. Uh, up to some point, uh, let's start from here, uh, you can decrease your truncation error by decreasing h, but if you keep decreasing it, then you have something called the round of error. This, uh, this time it uh, becomes dominant and it destroys all your uh, derivatives in, the, in a big system. So this is not applicable to any system uh, more complicated than a small model. Uh, you, uh, you, can, uh, inc uh, you can improve the situation by using more, uh, by using better approximations, but none of them really take care of the problem. And another problem with this is uh, for computing a gradient with something like this, you have to uh, evaluate this sort of formula for uh, as many times if you, as you, uh, as your number of input variables. For example, if you have a function like scalar function of uh, and inputs, you will have to compute the function forward n times for computing the full gradient with numerical approximations. So that's also out of the question. And we come to the uh, subject of automatic differentiation. So this is a small but established field in scientific computing. It's used in things like computational fluid dynamics. Uh, there is active research going on, and this is connected with machine learning through the backpropagation algorithm. So if you heard about backprop or used it, uh, you already know a bit of this. It corresponds to the uh, thing called uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation. Uh, so what I've been working on is to bring techniques from this field into machine learning so that, that you can do uh, more intelligent things than backprop. Uh, so I will briefly cover uh, how automatic differentiation works. It also uh, gives you an understanding of how backpropagation works if you are interest in knowing about it. Uh, so in automatic differentiation, you have an algorithm. Uh, let's go today, or let's look at this thing. Like uh, it's a function of two variables. Uh, so you have techniques of taking this uh, computer program and giving you another program that uh, evaluates this function. And in addition to that, it evaluates the derivative of the function. And this can be completely automated. So for example, what you see here is the uh, forward mode automatic differentiation. I will cover it in the next slide better. But you see that uh, because you have a multiplication, C is a multiplication of A and B. Uh, you still maintain that here. C is a multiplication of A and B. And the deriv derivative of C uh, is this expression coming from the uh, multiplication rule from the rules of differentiation. So you apply that to all your elementary operations in your trace, and you get the uh, uh, derivative with respect to uh, one of your inputs in the end. So I will expect why is that one of the inputs uh, in the next slide. Uh, and an important thing to point out is that you get exact derivatives. This is not a numerical approximation. Uh, 
uh, it's as good as it gets. It's uh, as if you had like a, a symbolic formula for your derivative and you evaluated it. And uh, so it's not an uh, approximation. Uh, so automatic differentiation has two modes. Uh, these are called forward and reverse. Forward is very straightforward. And reverse is the one uh, that people know as backprop. Uh, it is a bit uh, difficult or strange to understand the first time you see it, but it's not, uh, it's not really so bad. Uh, so let's start with the forward mode. Let's say you have a function that looks like this. You can express this as a computation graph uh, with two inputs here and the output here. And these are uh, intermediate uh, uh, values that show you the dependency structure of this uh, function. Uh, so you can see that uh, you, you do a multiplication here, you do a subtraction here, you do, I think this is a sign, and you combine everything uh, to get your scalar value. Uh, so in forward mode, you start by uh, selecting a variable of differentiation, uh, any of your inputs, then uh, you mirror your computation graph uh, and introduce for each intermediate variable, a, a new variable called the tangent uh, tangent variable. I think I should, okay, I should have set tangent here. This is called the tangent. And this means the derivative of that node with respect to the input node you selected. So uh, in forward mode, you take the derivative with respect to one of your inputs. This is the difference uh, between the forward mode and the reverse mode. Uh, so let's say uh, let's say we want to differentiate this uh, this function uh, with respect to the uh, the first input x1. So here on the left you see uh, the uh, regular execution of the function. You just uh, uh, so I selected two and five uh, as the input values, for, uh, and when you execute the thing, you get the. 11.65 as the output. This is called the uh, forward evaluation trace. And in addition to this, uh, you do a derivative trace. And you, there you set uh, the derivative of x1 to 1 and the derivative of uh, x2 to 0. Uh, this is the meaning that uh, you are taking derivatives with respect to x1, because x1's derivative with respect to itself will be 1. And because these are considered independent inputs, this thing will be 0. And if you do this, and if you just derive the differentiation rules uh, corresponding to each elementary operation in your execution, uh, and you, you keep uh, using the values you get, and in the end you get the, you, you, you get the value here that, which corresponds to the derivative of your final scalar with respect to the uh, input value for, for which you set the tangent to 1. This is the forward mode. Uh, and uh, in the reverse mode, we will do the reverse thing, and uh, you will see why it's uh, so, uh, used so much in uh, neural networks and backpropagation. Uh, so what is happening in uh, uh, okay, let's just skip this. What is happening in the reverse mode is that uh, as we introduce these tangents uh, in the forward mode, now we introduce uh, nodes called adjoints. Uh, this is just the terminology they use in automatic differentiation field uh, that hold derivative values. Uh, but there's a little uh, uh, point to be careful about. So these new nodes, they represent the derivative of the final output with respect to that node. If you remember in the forward mode, the, this thing was uh, the derivative of that node with respect to an input. In this case, uh, this derivative represents the derivative of the output with respect to this node. And, uh, and you do things in reverse. So let me try to explain that. Uh, uh, the thing on the left, like this column, remains the same. It's just the forward evaluation of the same function with the same values and the same output. So corresponding to each row, each elementary operation, uh, again, you have the differentiation rules, but this time, uh, uh, we don't set anything uh, in the adjoint trace uh, starting from the top because we start from the uh, bottom. So uh, let me say this again in a clearer way. So you do the forward evaluation. You are here or you start from left to the right. You compute all these nodes. Then you do a back propagation. 
uh, which I represent with this arrow going back towards the inputs here. And this time you start by setting the adjoint of the output to one. Uh, again, you can interpret that as being one because this is the derivative of something with respect to itself. And uh, you go through these operations in reverse. And at each point you get the derivative of the node you are in, uh, derivative of the output with respect to the node you are in. So if you keep propagating things backwards, you get the derivative of the output with respect to uh, both inputs in one uh, reverse evaluation. As you can see, like if you have uh, millions and millions of these inputs, it will still take you just one forward and one reverse evaluation to get the full gradient, the, the, the derivative of, the, of your one output with respect to all these inputs. So this is the reason this is uh, used so much in deep learning because we have a case where we have a loss function, uh, a scalar value, uh, and we, we take gradients of that with respect to uh, millions of uh, neural network weights, for example. And uh, this is the reason backpropagation was invented in the uh, neural network community. Uh, so this is how something like this looks like in the machine learning framework, PyTorch. Uh, we will see this in the uh, afternoon exercise session. And uh, to sum up, uh, in the extreme case where you have a, uh, a vector valid function of one variable uh, with forward AD, just uh, forward run. You can get the, the, the full set of partial derivatives with respect to uh, the one input in just one forward evolution. And in the other extreme, if you have a scalar valid function of many inputs with, for, uh, with reverse AD, you can get the full gradient in just one application. And there are things in between. Uh, this is not uh, appreciated in the deep learning community right now. Uh, in the general case, if you have a function with n inputs and m outputs, uh, backpropagation is not always the, the thing to do if you are after efficiency. Uh, backpropagation is only better if you have uh, more uh, uh, significantly more inputs than your outputs. Uh, in the other case, you would prefer forward differentiation. But this is not encountered uh, so much in uh, machine learning field. Uh, so I will uh, connect this, how, uh, connect all this to uh, what is going on in deep learning frameworks. Uh, so you can classify deep learning frameworks into two types. Uh, the first I call symbolic graph builders, uh, and the second is the dynamic graph builders. Uh, this, this name is emerging in deep learning to refer to automatic differentiation. Uh, so in symbolic builders like uh, TensorFlow or Tiano, uh, you implement your models in, using symbolic placeholders using the mini language that, uh, that is given to you by the, uh, by the framework. For example, this, is, this here is in Tiano. You have like a input tensor. Uh, you do shuffling. You do element-wise multiplication. Uh, you, you are supposed to implement all your model uh, using these placeholders. Then you tell the framework to differentiate this, and uh, it, it, does the, it applies the symbolic differentiation rules, and it, it makes the graph transformation, gives you the derivative, and for taking care of the expression swell problem that I was talking about, it does some optimization step. And if you use Teano, this is the reason it's taking so long in the compilation step uh, to get the derivative out. So you, you end up with the derivative graph uh, as a uh, result of the transformation, and you use that for getting your gradients so that you can use them in uh, uh, gradient-based optimization. And uh, the problem with this is that uh, you have severely limited and unintuitive ways of implementing things like uh, branching and loops. Uh, you are supposed to use uh, strange constructs for uh, doing something like that. For example, if you use Tiano, there is this thing called the scan operation. This is how you implement a loop, and uh, they have rules of handling loops. Uh, so Tiano is, uh, for those uh, who know, is uh, implemented in Python. You are not allowed to use the for, uh, for loop structure in Python, for example. It's completely out of the question. Uh, so. Uh, this, this is what I'm, uh, uh, let me cl clarify what I mean by this. 
So for example, let's say you want to compute this a to the power of k. Uh, as a programmer, you will just, uh, for example, write something like this, uh, like multiply a k times uh, with itself, right? So in TN or, or TensorFlow, you cannot do this. Uh, you are supposed to use this uh, very strange <laughs> and intuitive thing so that you can emulate doing some sort of loop like that. And uh, this is happening because they are not using real automatic differentiation. This is uh, happening because of symbolic differentiation. This is also the case for TensorFlow. Also, uh, the thing that C and TK, Microsoft uh, cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive Framework. Uh, so the difference uh, in dynamic graph builders is that uh, you have full support for control flow, branching, loops, uh, recursion, procedure calls, whatever you want. Uh, so this is because if you remember uh, this uh, execution trace, uh, what we are doing here is that we are just overloading operations uh, that, that are supported by our language, like if you, if you just uh, overload mathematical operations that, uh, and introduce derivative rules for them. You don't care about what the rest of your algorithmic control flow. You are blind to that. Look, this, this operation can be the result of an if statement. You don't care about that because it doesn't show up here. Or you could be in a loop. You could do these things many times. At the end of the day, any algorithm that you could write will be executed as a forward uh, evaluation trace of mathematical functions. Uh, for getting a mathematical value, you will only do mathematical uh, operations. So this is the reason uh, why in, uh, for example, PyTorch, you can just write this. Uh, yeah. Uh, like this is uh, sufficiently similar to the way you would do it in regular Python. You just define a PyTorch variable with the value initiated to initialize as one. You just do your regular for loop and you can get the derivative out. So we will look at that in the exercise session just to uh, familiarize you with this. Uh, so this is something that, that, that is a recent development in the machine learning community. Uh, this, uh, it started with Autograd, uh, which is a project I think by now two or three years old right now. It was like a little Python project implemented at Harvard. Then uh, the same people implemented that on top of tor the Torch uh, deep learning framework introduced automatic differentiation, general purpose reverse mode automatic differentiation to that. Uh, PyTorch came out of uh, this uh, lineage. Uh, it is a re-implementation of uh, the whole Torch framework, just uh, uh, taking into account this uh, automatic differentiation idea. This is a very important development, and I expect the other uh, deep learning frameworks to follow this. So this is the reason I'm talking about it so much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we will cover this in the exercise session. And the summary of all this is uh, deep learning is uh, neural networks plus data plus gradient descent. You do that for, uh, for a long time. Sometimes you do like a week of training on a GPU just to teach a neural net to recognize some set of images. And you need a lot of data. So uh, Tuanan is going to cover uh, how this uh, couples uh, with uh, probabilistic programming. So instead of having a uh, training data set, you will get things from a probabilistic program where you also have labels. And if your model is good enough, you will get data that is sufficiently similar to uh, things in nature or things in the problem domain that you are trying to address. And uh, general purpose aid is uh, something that is currently being uh, adopted in the machine learning community. And uh, so more, I expect more things to happen in this area because uh, all this uh, explanation I had about automatic differentiation was uh, referring to op operator overloading. There are uh, other ways of doing these things. For example, you can do source-to-source uh, -source transformations. This is not something uh, even uh, taught about in the machine learning community right now. You can do source transformation uh, automatic differentiation, which is something people do in computational fluid dynamics all the, all the time. Uh, this is uh, something that is waiting to be recognized by the machine learning community. 
there is no forward AD in any of these uh, mainstream uh, uh, frameworks. You might think that it might it is not needed for machine learning, but if you have that, and if you have general purpose uh, AD with nesting possibility, you can do things like you can do forward automatic differentiation, and you can apply uh, reverse automatic differentiation on top of that, or you can do the other way, you can do reverse on forward. You can do many levels of differentiation to get things like higher order derivatives or Hessian vector products or uh, uh, any number of things that you can, uh, I mean, you, you can have uh, exact higher order derivatives that are useful for uh, better optimization algorithms or uh, implementing things like uh, invariance in your neural network by just uh, trying to minimize the derivative with respect to your uh, network inputs, uh, whatever. So this, if you have these things uh, in your machine learning framework, it gives you more uh, express, expressiveness to uh, implement uh, better machine learning net, uh, models. Uh, so I guess uh, this is the end of this. Uh, I actually it's good because we are back on time. Uh, it's 11 right now. <laughs> uh, so I can take questions and uh, so we will do these things in the exercise session uh, later in the afternoon. Yeah. I think mostly because of the performance problem, because in, like the main thing you need is a gradient. If you have a gradient, like if you have a function that is a, a function of 10 inputs for finite differences, you have to do 10 evaluations of that. Mm -hmm. it, in each evalu evaluation, you would add like this perturbation, this h, division by h. Uh, you, you add the h to the uh, input you divide by h, you do one evaluation, then you do the next, you do the next. It's like it's a, it's a very bad uh, thing to do in terms of performance. I think that's the main reason. Uh, because uh, interestingly, deep learning models, the, these deep neural networks, they are very resilient with respect to errors. There are cases where people like that had the bug in their neural network, that it was doing the wrong thing internally. It doesn't make sense mathematically, but it was still uh, performing the task in, at the end of the day because it learns to uh, live with that and adapt the weights to uh, function that way. So I think they wouldn't care about the approximation error too much if it was good enough performance, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh,